Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Our guest today is Dan Gingis, the experience maker. And what we're going to talk about today is how you can turn your business into the kind of business that people not only want to do business with initially, but will want to keep doing business with over time. This is critical if you're going to grow your business. You can't be, and Dan will tell us about the leaky boat, you can't be the leaky boat taking on new customers and losing them because they're somehow unhappy about some aspect of dealing with your business. This is not just about customer service, but it's about the entirety of how customers perceive dealing with you. If you're in any tough competitive market, then this is an opportunity for you to really set yourself apart, create some distance between you and your competitors, and win more business. Let's listen to Dan as he joins our show. Welcome, Dan, to the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Well, thank you so much, Jose. I am thrilled to be here. Well, this is great uh, because you you really get into an area that I think a lot of people uh, don't fully understand, don't fully appreciate. So just to set the stage, tell our audience a little bit about yourself and who you serve and what you do for them, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Well, I am a customer experience speaker, coach, author, and podcaster. In other words, I live and breathe customer experience every day. And I come at it from a different perspective because I spent 20 years in corporate America, both at big companies like Discover, Humana, and McDonald's, but also at smaller B2B companies and even a late stage startup just for good measure. So I've been in the trenches working on this for 20 plus years. And what I talk about and what I teach now is based on everything that I've learned in that time. So it's not just a bunch of platitudes that uh, I can't prove out. It's things that I know actually work, uh, supplemented by lots of stories of companies that are doing it really well. Wow. So so let's just even start with the definition of customer experience or CX or whatever. So some people say, well, isn't that just customer service? Uh, you know, what, what is, so let's get a good working definition here for our audience. Sure. So in my mind, customer experience is how a customer feels about every single interaction they have with a company. And the key points there are how they feel because perception is reality. If they feel frustrated by your mobile app, it doesn't matter that your, your coders and programmers are telling you we have the best mobile app out there if, if it's frustrating customers. And every single experience suggests that whether it's marketing, advertising, customer service, using the product, going to the website, all of that feeds into the experience. So customer service is just one piece of the overall experience. And in fact, as a wiser man than I once said, customer service is what happens when customer experience breaks. Because after all, if we had a perfect customer experience, we wouldn't need a customer service department, right? Um, people don't call just to tell us we're doing a great job. They call because something's wrong. So think of that as a subset of customer experience. Well, and that's kind of like when the quality movement, you know, 30, 40 years ago in, in American manufacturing really took hold. And uh, the whole principle that quality isn't something you delegate to the quality department. It's something you have to weave into everything. So it's kind of a take on, on that on that thought. Uh, so, you know, one question, and I know we've had a little conversation on this before, is just somebody maybe in a B2B company and maybe not a mega like a Boeing or, or John Deere, but, you know, typical owner-led business maybe has this question, well, wait a second, this, this sounds like a B2C thing. I'm not a retailer. I'm not a restaurant. Uh, does this really apply in a B2B sense? Well, it's a great question and one that I get all the time. And my answer somewhat sarcastically is, it depends. Do you market your services to humans? And then I pause while they think about that for a moment. And they say, well, of course. And I said, well, good, then this matters. And the reason is, is that those humans are consumers. They may not be consumers in, in the business that they're doing with you. They may be a a business to business relationship, mm -hmm. but in their real lives, they are consumers. And so that person likely went out to dinner last week with his or her significant other and had an amazing meal with impeccable service and a great atmosphere. And the reality is the experience they're having with you is being compared to that, right? Any e-commerce experience that we have ever is being compared to the e-commerce experience on Amazon because it's the best. 
Right. And so you are getting compared to that. And it is really critical because people do business with people they like and they do business with companies that are there for them. And that is CX. So it's absolutely critical for B2B companies to be focused on this as well. But but let me go to the example you gave in, in e-commerce, right? So like Amazon. So somebody listening might say, well, that's really not fair because I, I can't be Amazon. Of course, if, if Jeff Bezos would lend me a few billion dollars, maybe I could approach it. So is this something that is, is attainable in any meaningful way if what I'm being compared against is world-class organizations that are many times bigger than me with much deeper resources? You know, what's interesting is they might be many times bigger with deeper resources, but you're probably more nimble and agile because you're smaller. And so the reality is nobody's asking you to out Amazon, Amazon. You can't. They're the best at what they do for a reason. But we can learn from them in terms of what they do really well. And one of the reasons Amazon is so good is they are one of the most customer centric companies in the world. That's actually in their value statement is to become the most customer centric company in the world. And so when you approach business problems from a customer lens, you end up with solutions that are both better for the customer and more profitable. And that's what Amazon has figured out. So no, you don't have to have an e-commerce site that is as good as Amazon's. But I'll give you a, a real simple example in a B2B space. Mm -hmm. There are so many SaaS companies out there that are selling their product. And when you go to their website, if you took out the logo, you probably couldn't tell one site from another. They in all a have a category, I, especially like if I looked up project management software, there's 52 correct. of them, they all look identical. Correct. And I wrote an article about this a couple of years ago, one of my favorite articles about website navigation and how B2Bs, especially in the SaaS area, they're, they're guilty of this. They all have literally the same navigation at the top. And the problem was, according to the study that I looked at, Customers don't understand the difference between services and resources and, you know, all these words that we just throw out there. They don't, they don't get it, right? And so I have a great example um, that I love to share about a B2B that has this typical long scrolling page of content. But then when you get to the bottom, it literally says, now that you're done scrolling, now would be a great time to start doing some clicking. And it's like, wow, that's kind of fun, right? That's a, that. There's some personality here in this company. Right. There's another person who is a, a B2B. Uh, she actually works with speakers or speaker organizations. And she has a, a, a login part of her website. And the button, instead of saying login, says login, darling, because that's her personality, okay. right? And in one okay. word on a button, she's showing just gobs of personality. So- there's no law in B2B that says you have to be boring. And yet so many B2B companies are boring. And then what they do is they come up to folks like me and they say, well, how do I work on customer experience? My, we're boring. <laughs> I said, stop being boring. <laughs> that's a good start. Wow. Well, so that's interesting because like the example of the button, you're actually giving a tremendous amount of emotional and intellectual information in with that one word that's very powerful right so there's, there's a whole obviously there's a whole science in terms of user interface design and and user experience and so on like on the web but what about um if you look at more like just the business processes side of it and, I, and i'm not i'm not saying the web isn't a critical part of that i'm just saying just to move the conversation to a slightly different area of focus so i'm imagining somebody who's like a contract manufacturer they work with steel they'll make anything you want to make they make it in volume 10, 15, 20 million dollar type revenue business. Very yep. typical all over America, it exists, right? And there's thousands and thousands of these companies. Um, it's kind of a rugged business. It's like, you know, just it's steel, it's melting stuff and smelting it and all that other stuff. How does that, how do you, the principles of, of CX apply in that context? So great question. I'm a believer that competing on price is a loser's game. And I'm sure the steel people would agree with me. Mm -hmm. If we're going to compete on price, it's going to be a race to the bottom and we're all going to lose. If we're going to compete on product, that's really hard because we're all selling the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if you can't compete on price, you can't compete on product. What's left is customer experience. And when I said people do business with people they like, that is how we differentiate. And so let me give you an example. 
in the B2B space, you often have a sales team. You always have a sales team. Mm -hmm. And that sales team is responsible for bringing on new customers. That is all they are gold on is new customers, new logos, new revenue. Now, the problem from the customer perspective is if we buy from people that we like, I talked to Jose, the salesperson. I really like him. I'm going to choose him over the other steel companies because I've got a connection with him. I trust him. I think he's going to really serve me well. I signed the contract. Two things happen next. One, Jose goes and celebrates with his buddies that he signed a new contract, but he doesn't celebrate with the customer, right? He goes and celebrates internally. They ring a bell, they have a Slack channel, whatever it is, but there's this big internal celebration and the guest of honor is not invited to the party. The second thing, and I'm sorry to use Jose as an example, no, that's all right. I'm but the second bad. thing that happens <laughs> is right after that contract is signed, Jose, who I now have established a relationship with, passes me on to somebody else and says, well, here, now you've got an account management team or a customer success team to go work with. Mm -hmm. And I, the customer, I'm saying, oh, hold on a second. Jose is my guy. Like, th that's why I'm here is because of Jose. I'm not here because your steel's any better. I'm here because of this person. And the second I sign a contract, the person ditches me. And that is a very bad way to start a relationship with a new customer. And understanding that your salespeople have to then go out and, and sell again make sure that your salespeople stay with the customer for at least the first 90 days. It doesn't mean you can't pass them on to an account management team, but the customer should know that the salesperson is always there for them and that they can call anytime if they run into trouble. Because otherwise what happens, Jose, is you pass me on to an account management team and for whatever reason, it's just not a good fit. Like mm -hmm. personality-wise, we don't click. So here I am, I'm unhappy. You have no idea I'm unhappy because you're off working on another sale. The next, the next sale. And right. ultimately, I'm going to leave. And so all that work you put into that sale, the company's not going to benefit because I'm not going to stay around. I'm going to end up leaving. And if you just hung on a little bit longer and, and said to me, Dan, if you run into any problems, I am here for you. Then when I have that problem with my account management team, I call you because you're my guy because I know you're going to fix it for me, right? And now I feel like... I'm important at this company that there's, a, you know, that I made a good decision in doing business with this company. So structurally B2Bs, I think are often set up wrong in that they just don't focus on what does the customer go through. And look, as customers, we don't want to be handed off. We want to be with the person that we fell in love with, right? And that right. we decided to spend our hard earned money with. So we really have to be careful. And the problem is that's right at the beginning of the relationship. It's like the moment of truth where we got to lock them in for long term. And instead, we send them off, you know, basically with buyer's remorse. Right. And that's the worst thing in the world, because you're actually dead man walking They're They're thinking already of ways to change their supplier the next time around the next time they need to place an order. You think you did great. You think you're settled. And so you end up with churn, which is death in creating any real growth because you're always replacing revenue. And that's just, it's, and it's exhausting at, at that point. It is. It, it puts more and more pressure on the sales team because they've got to meet their sales goals. Plus they need to make up for the revenue that was lost by the churn. And in my new book, I refer to this as the leaky bucket. And almost every company has a leaky bucket. These are customers that are drip, drip, dripping out of the bucket and leaving generally for your competition. And often they're not even telling you why they're leaving. And that, those are the most dangerous kind. I mean, if someone's going to leave my business, at least I'd like them to tell me why, because right. maybe I can fix it for the next customer. But most customers are so fed up, they don't. They just leave. And it's a double loss because you've lost the business and your competitor has gained the business. And so we need to plug that leaky bucket. And in doing so, we actually make the salespeople's jobs easier because if we're retaining more customers, we don't sure. have to put as much pressure on new sales. Well, and so tell us a little bit about your new book. I think that's important that we reference that as well, because I think I know having written books, it's it's a real effort to get there, to get over the finish line. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about it. Sure. Well, the new book is called The Experience Maker. I even have a prop here. Okay. How to create remarkable experiences that your customers can't wait to share. And it contains simple, practical, and inexpensive examples and ideas of how any company can amp up their customer experience game, how you can just do the little things to make your customer feel appreciated, welcomed into your business, in, you know, so that they are more likely to stick with you and reorder and be a customer forever. 
And what's also important is when you have happy customers, they share their happiness with other people. So they become your best reference points. They become your best case studies. They refer new business to you. Again, taking more and more pressure off of your sales team. Your best customers should be your best salespeople. That's how it should work if you've treated them really well and they feel like they get value out of you. So, so that's what the book's about. No, that's fantastic. And, and uh, it, it should be available on, on, on Amazon, the usual places. As we, available as we anywhere by books, yep. Fantastic. And we'll, we'll have a link on our show notes as well. So, uh, Dan, you know, one thing that comes to mind, and I always, when I do these interviews, I always channel like my my past clients through my mind and thinking, what 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 kind of questions? And I don't name names, but what kind of questions might they have? And I have clients that sell to very very large corporations, like the megas, right? And they often have to deal with procurement with like official buyers. So some of that relational stuff, the that the whole buyer side is designed to smash the human out of the process, right? So I'm just curious if there's any any kind of CX insights to maybe bridge that that gap, which isn't necessarily the, 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 the entity selling, but it's caused by the entity buying. That's a really great question. I've never had a question posed to me exactly that way. And my instinctive response says that in that scenario, the procurement team is probably being rewarded on cost. That's their whole job is to find the lowest cost provider. And at the end of the day, even if you get that job, when it's time to renew, they're just going to shop it again anyway. So this is never going to be your best customer. Now, I get it. It might be a multi-million dollar deal and it's worth it even to have them there once. But ultimately, you got to look at that customer as, look, if, I got, if I'm bringing on what is going to be basically a disloyal customer, right? Because every chance they get, they're going to shop me around. Right, intrinsically disloyal. It's, it's, yeah, like, I mean, it's baked into the system. Correct. But, that is, you know, probably not the type of customer that you want, that you generally want to pursue. And I will say, every company needs to go through this exercise. It's a tough one. The exercise is who... Who do we not want to market to? Mm -hmm. Who are the customers that are not for us? And by doing that, first of all, you save a ton of time on the sales side because you don't have them chasing after bad customers. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, let those customers go to the competitor, right? Like let sure. them deal with it. Some customers are just, are not worth it. And that's fine. But understanding who your product or service is not for, it's really, really important. And ultimately, if a company is only interested in price, that's really hard for anybody to compete unless you're the biggest and you can frankly, you know, offer the lowest price product. Right. I, I always tell, uh, again, owner led businesses say, don't try to be the low cost provider unless you can be the low cost buyer. And unless you're the biggest, you can't, but some of them are, are stuck in these ecosystems where like they sell to the aerospace giants and that is their market. Like they have yeah. no choice. So, um, but it's interesting because I find that the, even in that very our Darwinian environment, there's still people on the other side. So I think you can bridge that to some degree with some of the, the principles you talk about, but it'll never be that warm, fuzzy, let's let's join in celebration on the on the on the big win. I don't think it's gonna be quite that. Well, and and true. So let's take a step forward beyond the sales process. So there's also the element of what is it like to do business with you? Mm -hmm. You know, once you have that contract, are you delivering what the salesperson promised? If I have a problem, can I get it easily resolved? You know, are you, so if you are an easy company to do business with, that is a good experience and you're more likely to get that renewal and not have you be shopped out. If you are very difficult, if your salesperson promised the world and the company can't deliver on it, then that's a customer experience fail and you're likely to lose the business. So it doesn't just happen at the sales moment. And your aerospace example is just like that, right? Let's say you're selling <clears throat> jets, right? Well, the salesperson is saying, I'm going to sell you X number of jets and they're going to be delivered by Y date at Z price. Mm -hmm. If it turns out that you can't end up delivering that, the, <clears throat> the chances of you getting the deal the next time, not real high. And so all of that gets fed into the customer experience. Well, wow. so what are some, just at the time we have remaining here, Dan, some like uh, if you were to say to a, a business owner, definitely pay attention to these top three things. It may not solve everything. It may not make you like the world-class CX firm, you know, 
ever, but it'll improve the game. It'll improve your game, and they're not they're not the big heavy lifts. What things come to mind that way? Well, the first thing I always suggest, and it is a lot harder in B two B, is to become a customer of your own company. And if you can't do that, then attach yourself at the hip to one of your customers, to somebody who will tell you like it is, who will give you a play-by-play -play of working with your company. Because what so often happens is that we're on the other side of the fence, right? We're not on the customer side. So we see things from an inside out perspective, but our customers see it from an outside in perspective. And if we're not aware of what our customers are experiencing, we don't, we can't do anything about it. And so many companies miss this, right? And so uh, I'll give you an example that's actually an internal example, because this happens with employees as well. And one of my companies that I worked for, I was asked to uh, put together a video for an all employee meeting. And so I grabbed this intern and we shot this hilarious video that was about an intern trying to launch a new product at this company. And it showed all of the hassles that he had to go through in the company. He had to meet with legal and the brand team and the marketing team and everybody had questions and everybody pushed back and this guy's all flustered and what have you. Now, the audience was laughing and falling out of their seats hysterical. The only person that wasn't laughing in the room was the CEO. And when the video ended, the CEO leaned over to one of his deputies and asked, is it really like this? The CEO was so far from the action Wow. That he had no idea that the reason everyone was laughing at that video was because they all could relate to it, right? True. The same is true with our customers, is if we can't, if we don't know what they're going through, if we don't know how annoying our ordering system is, or how difficult it is to track orders or whatever it is, if we don't know that, we can't do anything about it. So that's the first, I would say relatedly is listen to your customers. There's two ways we do that. There's quantitative feedback, things like CSAT scores and, um, and NPS scores. Those are great. It's a good start. It tells you how you're doing. What it doesn't tell you is why. And so the third piece is you have to get qualitative feedback. You have to actually speak to customers. I don't want you to do it in a, in a digital form. I want you to pick up the phone and have regular contact with your customers. And human ask to them, human. <laughs> how are we doing, right? <laughs> right? And I'll tell you the literal voice of the customer, there is nothing more powerful because when you ask somebody for feedback, you're gonna get it. And look, you're gonna get great feedback, take that and make sure you do more of it. And you're gonna get critical feedback, mm -hmm. take that and make sure you fix it. Because if that customer's having that issue, I guarantee you other customers are as well. Wow, wow. Well. Dan, this has been great. And it's one of my favorite topics because, again, helping people try to grow their businesses, grow revenue. The leaky bucket, I love that example because it's not just, you, know, you can get all the leads you want and sign up new business. If you're losing it on the back end just as fast, you're not going to attain growth. So that's fantastic. Your new book is The Experience Maker, available everywhere. And if somebody wanted to know more about you, your work, or to talk to you, where, where should they go? What would be the best place? Sure. Best place is to go to dangingus.com and uh, all of my work is there. Uh, but I'm also very active on LinkedIn and Twitter at dgingus, particularly also on the other socials, but those are the two that I'm there more often. And if you're interested in the book, uh, head over to the experiencemakerbook.com and you can learn all about it. Fantastic. Dan Gingus, thank you so much for taking this time with us on the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jose. I really appreciate it.